show. Um, and tonight we are going to talk about staying in position. But before we do that, I just want to offer up a prayer for those um, as we are thinking about standing positions, what our you know goals are, what we need to be doing within Christ. Sometimes we need guidance for that. Sometimes we're struggling with that. And I just want to offer up a prayer for those who may be going through those trying times, wondering just how am I going to really stay in this position to go where God needs me to go. You know, Heavenly Father, I pray for guidance for not only in my endeavors, but those who are listening this evening or listening to this on the replay. I would like for you to lead us through the paths of righteousness as we've been struggling with trying to accomplish tasks on our own. Guide us, Father, as we listen attentively to the sound of your voice. We want to be receptive to your call. Bless us in everything we do and help us to rely solely on your promises. Let us know that things are possible because we believe in you. We can only do all things through you who gives us strength. We thank you. We love you. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and the praise. In your son's precious and holy name, amen. So let's talk about staying in position. Now, Staying in position and staying in your lane are two different things. And I know some people have asked me before, what is the difference, you know, if I'm staying in my lane, I'm doing what I need to do, I'm doing what I have to do. Absolutely. You, you can say that definitely. However, you know, when you stay in position, you're staying where God needs you to be. That's what you're doing. So it goes beyond just standing in a lane, keeping your head down in the grind, doing the things that you need to do. You are literally being in place where God wants you to be. So, so many of us kind of confuse the two. We say, you know what, we're in our lane. We're doing all the things that we need to do. We don't understand why we have to be so intent and in focus. And we do. We really do have to be intent and focused and doing the things that we need to do. But I'm going to give a couple of scriptures that I use in reference to staying in position. And one of my favorites is James, the first chapter, verses 67. And it says, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and toss. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So when it means stand in position, it means staying still. Now, anyone who has children know that staying still for children can be difficult. Because the minute you tell them to stay still, they are going to see something that they want, and they're going to want it now. And so, therefore, they're going to keep moving. They're going to try to touch it. Mommy, but look. Daddy, look. And you keep saying, sit still. Don't move. Don't touch that. No, you can't have that. And it's the same thing that the Father is telling us. You know, he is telling us, you know what, sit still. Stay where I put you. There is a reason I put you here, and I don't need you to move. But just like children, we're hard-headed, and we want to do what we want when we want how we want to. So in order to stay in position, we have to be obedient. You know, if you ever think about it from time to time, if you really listen to the Holy Spirit, he will ask you, where are you? And he's not asking you for your physical location, but rather where you are as it relates to your relationship with him. When he asks this, it normally means you are out of position or you're starting to get out of position. Now, for me personally, it normally means I'm not spending the time with him that is required for my spiritual development. He wants you to actually answer the question by looking at your relationship with him and to begin to peel it apart. Now, for example, 
And this happens is if I would say, you know, Lord, I have not been reading and praying like I should. I have not been meditating on your word, and I'm not trusting you like I should. Like if you really assess yourself and be honest and repent to the Lord, he will help you quickly get back into position. Now, if you don't answer the question, you will find yourself drifting further and further from the Lord. And let me just elaborate on that. Um, A few years ago, I was in a position, again, I have my own businesses, um, but I also have also worked for other people. And I was in this position, and I was frustrated, and God has always told me what he wanted me to do in reference to my businesses and in reference to ministry. However, I decided instead of putting in the work, putting in the time, and doing what I needed to do, I kind of just was like, yeah, I'm just going to get another job. And that's exactly what I did. And only three years later, I feel the same way I did. I'm unfulfilled. I'm unhappy. I'm kind of stressed. And it's just like it has nothing to do with the money. And at first I would say that. It's like, oh, it's about the money. They're not paying me enough. They're not doing the things that they need to do. They're, they're not being there for me. I'm not getting what I'm looking for overall. And that's not what was happening. What happened was is that I was out of position. And once I was out of position, there was nothing more. I kept drifting further and further away because I was just just sitting there just like God was like, I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to get you to see and come back. But you, you so far in your own head, you so far into what you think you know instead of doing and walking like I know. And so when you adrift, you take the covering he has on you you know, for your protection, and it and it's substituted for something that cannot cover you, and that is your own understanding. And so I learned that, you know what, Lord, I'm not going to do the opposite. I'm going to follow you inexplicably. I'm going to do everything that you've told me to do. Now, I'm a witness. A year ago, I was in such a spiraled place because I was still trying to figure it out on my own. I was still trying to do it on my own. At that point, I wasn't covered because I had strayed so far out of my position, I wasn't covered, and the enemy was attacking me left and right. He was attacking me in areas that I normally was strong in. You know, I was in a very weakened state. And because I was in a weakened state, I was not able to engage in the spiritual warfare that I needed to do to protect myself because I had no protection. I had no covering. I stripped that away when I decided I was going to do what I want to do. And so many of us have done that. And we just said we're going to do it on our own, and then we get beaten, battered, and we're torn. And at that point, you get tired of getting beat up. You get tired of getting discouraged. You know, after the discouragement sets in, you know, you start to go back to the things you were delivered from. You know, and once you do that, that's not good. So you think about a branch. If you cut a branch from its vine, it does not appear to be an immediate change to the branch. But if you monitor it over a course of a few days, you will begin to see the visual impact of the branch being separated from its source of life. You know, sometimes the drama we experience is a direct result of us stepping outside of God's covering and trying to do our own thing. You know, don't grow weary, we, you know, in doing good, stay in the word, even when you feel like it's not making a difference. It's important to read the word every day. And people was like, you know, how can I do that? I'm so busy. I'm always on the go. It's not an excuse, but I could have maybe understood that maybe 10 years ago 
when you have a big, huge study Bible. Trust me, I have several. And I have a Schofield study Bible, hardcover. So imagine always carrying that with you. However, with technology and the apps, you can get the Bible anywhere. You can get it to read it to you while you're driving, while you're going anywhere. So there's no excuse for not being able to be in his word daily. You know, we make time for everything else we want to do. So, for example, many of us have Kindle. I don't. I I like to physically read a book. But many of them have Kindle. We have, you know, books on tape, CD, Amazon Alexa, your favorite book. You will go ahead and play it while you sit in the car. You can do the same thing with God's Word. It's just a matter of choice. And this is not to convict and not to browbeat on anyone because I'm guilty sometimes of that too. I get so caught up in wanting to hear about the next good book or the next business book that I sometimes neglect putting God in my day. But what happens is is that once I correct that and I see it, I correct it immediately. I correct it immediately. Because, see, what we have to do is we have to trust in the Lord and not to lean to our own understanding. And we have to keep praying, you know, even when we feel like God's not listening. God is always listening to us. He loves us. He wants the best for us. But, again, once we walk away, we have to invite him back in before he can do the things he's purposed for us to do. You know, and when you think about staying in position, it's about keeping your joy. You know, our joy, the joy of the Lord is our essential to providing a productive Christian life on this earth. You know, the enemy's goal is to kill, steal, and destroy anything that looks like and acts like God. His goal is to get you to define your joy as your square footage the car you drive, the house you live in, the job you have, the clothes you got, who you know, who you connected with, how much money is in the bank. That is what he does. He tries to get you to say that that's your joy, that that's your priority. Those are your goals. That's what makes you happy. So he does that to take your mind off of what God needs you to be. You know, now although it's nothing wrong, you know, with having these things, you cannot allow the, to them to compete with our relationship with God. The joy of the Lord is our strength. You know, sometimes we also be like, you know, why we are going through these things. Because sometimes we are dealing with a lot of the consequences of our actions, and we have allowed the enemy to deceive us. We've allowed that small opening for him to slither through to get us to turn our eyes away from God, you know. And if you're in that position, I have been there. I have been there. I have been there. And you always feel like... It, he doesn't love you anymore. You feel like he just doesn't want you, that you've done so wrong that he can never, ever use you to build a kingdom. And again, never let anyone tell you that God doesn't love you. He loves us in spite of us. But what you have to do, like you would do your mother, your father, your friend, your cousin, you have to ask the Lord for forgiveness and to restore you to the joy of his salvation and to uphold you with the willing spirit. You know, we have to repent to the Lord and ask him to help us thirst and hunger after him again. You know, although it may seem like very basic knowledge to the average believer, this is how the enemy operates. Now, while we're so focused on what may be the big issues, he operates in the background you know, sifting us slowly. And that brings me to John 10.10. It says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. 
what when you come out of the position and the enemy has kind of almost tried to really put a stronghold in your life, you may be questioning, like, I don't understand what he wants from me. And it says, when you think about this scripture, it says, what is the, you know, you think about what is the enemy stealing? He's stealing, trying to steal your blessing. What is he killing? He's killing your dreams. What is his primary thing to destroy? Your destiny. Now, for some of you who are not football fans, I apologize, but it's going to be a football reference because I am a football fan. And it, it made perfect sense when I did it. You know, think, let's think football, for those who may not understand. Basically, you have the football, you're playing the game, and your favorite team throws an interception. And when you see it, you hot. Now, the quarterback, which is God, throws the ball. That ball is your blessing. You know, and when he throws it, he intends for it to get to you. You know, he intends for it to get to you. And so he's sitting there and he's positioning. And if you've ever watched a game, you're sitting there, you're, you're seeing how he's rolling, you're seeing how he's moving, and he's just waiting. And he's waiting and he throws it. He throws it to you, which you're the receiver. He's throwing it to you to catch. However, if you were out of position, with the direction that the ball is going, which is your blessing, and you go in the other direction, which is unbelief, fear, and doubt, then the player on the other team, which is the enemy, is free to intercept, which is still the ball, which is your blessing. Once he intercepts the ball, he is free to run in the other direction away from you with the ball, meaning your blessings. So the goal is to keep ourselves in line with God and his words by prayer and belief so that we can stay in position with the blessings God has for us. You know, remember, the Lord said that whatever you ask for in prayer, you'll receive if you believe. But that belief is not only during the prayer. You must also believe and stand in that belief until you receive what you pray for. When you start doubting, you start going in another direction, away from the blessing the Lord has for you. So how do you stand in your belief? You know, one of the best ways I've found is by speaking Scripture out loud when the enemy tries to sow seeds of doubt. And he's good at that because he's, you know, think of this. He tried to tempt Jesus. So if he tempted the Son of Man, Son of God, we are not exempt from his plans and his schemes and his finagling into what he's trying to do and how he's trying to do it. He tempted Jesus. Try to tell the Son of Man, the Son of God, who is the maker of all things, the beginning, the end, the Alpha and Omega, that if you worship me, I'll give you all of this. You, you're telling the man that who owns all of this that you're going to give it to him. If he was so bold to do that, what do you think he would do to us? And that's the amazing thing. If, if he just was so bold and said, you know what? I'm just going to give it to you. Just go ahead and believe in me, and I'm going to give it to you. It was just like a conversation that I was having with a colleague a couple of days ago. We have been placed on this earth, and God knows the decisions that we're going to make because he's given us free will. And sometimes we think we can outsmart God. Now, Maybe none of you would believe that, but I sure used to think I could. And even though I knew better, I still at least attempted and tried. I thought that I can just do this and make this better, or I'm going to go ahead and help God along with this process because I, I felt I knew better. 
and, and it's, it's hilarious because he knows you're going to do it. He knows what the outcome is going to be when you do it. And he knows there's going to be one or two things that you're either going to come to him or you're going to be stubborn and stay in the mess. Now, because we have free will, he allows us to go through this process. But with his word and his guidance, he has is, he is kind of guide us toward the correct thing. But like that rebellious child, we're like, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. And then we decide to go left, and he's been steering us right. And then we end in never, never land. So don't leave from your position. Do not move. Do not get out of alignment with God's will. You know, we have to remain steadfast, unmovable, always abiding in the word. Remaining steadfast in the faith, diligent in prayer, is applying his word to your life. You know, follow after him even when it gets tough. And trust me, it gets tough. It gets thick. You know, the fire gets turned up to 50 million degrees, and you be like, okay, you know, I'm sweating. It's beyond sweating now. I just, I can't do this. And if you like me, I don't really like to sweat like that. I, I like to be cute, you know. But when he is putting you through, uh, to take you through to the next level, cute is not going to work with him. You're going to have to do some work. You're going to have to sweat. There's going to be some tears. There's going to be some hurt. There's going to be some pulling and cleaning out infectious places. It's going to be some purging. And not only in you, but it's going to be purging from friends and family and people you knew and from situations. You know, people that you thought had your back is down the road somewhere, ain't thinking about you, and you sitting here wondering, where did I go wrong? You know, so... You have to never come out of position, you know. Though, again, it might be hard, and I say this all the time. It may be hard. It may be difficult. You may be times you want to throw in the towel, but it's so worth it in the end. I am a firm believer and a witness to it's so worth it in the end, you know. Being in position doing what he tells you to do. Like today, I was able to go to a conference that I send, I, I'd never, I never can make. I'm either busy with client stuff, my own personal craziness, and I know the last time it came to Atlanta, it was in 2016, and 2015 and 2016 are years that have completely gone by me. Those were some of the roughest years that I can imagine in my adult adult life outside of my divorce. Those were the years that I lost so many people that were close to me, and I just felt like I was just numb. I do not remember much of that year, like those years. I know they were here. I know I was there. I know I existed, but I truly do not remember much from those years. And again, I was still just aimlessly wandering, deciding to do what I wanted to do. You know, it was also in 2016 when he was trying to direct me to where he needed me to be. But I remained so walled up in my own grief and my own pain that I didn't want to listen to him. I'm like looking at this like, Lord, you know what I'm going through. You know what's happened. You know what I'm doing. You know why I'm going through the things that I'm going through. I ain't got time to worry about this. I need to do what I need to do to just try to make it through. And so, you know what? I ended up in a spiral yet again. And then once you come back to him, it's amazing. But those, the last from 2016 up until last June of 2018, that has been some rough, tough times because I fought with him about what he needed from me. I fought with him about where I should be. I've 
decided that I wanted to do my own thing, and then I would repent and start doing what he wanted to do, and then it wouldn't be fast enough for me, and I would decide that I was going to do something else, only for him to put me in another holding pattern because I just was stubborn, and I refused to do what he wanted and needed me to do. And it was in June of last year when he used someone else that I really respected and, you know, looked up to, and the person said to me, it was like, you are just so selfish. And I was so hurt when this person said this to me. And I said, I don't understand. Why am I selfish? Please explain to me why am I selfish. And this is because you have a testimony you have a ministry, and you have things that God needs you to walk fully in, and every time you walk away from him, you're depriving someone else of their healing. You're depriving someone else light to the kingdom. So therefore, you're selfish because instead of doing what you need to do, you're doing what you want to do, and there are people who are dependent on you getting in position and getting back in position and doing what you need to do. They are in the limbo waiting for you to do what you're supposed to do three years ago, two years ago, two hours ago. So think of it as this way. When God is trying to put us back in position, it is never fully for us. We may think it is, but it's never fully for us. It is for the greater purpose of the kingdom. He is putting us back in position because there's someone else who has maybe gone through what you've gone through and is at their last end of the rope, and they don't know how they're going to make it, how they're going to get through, and they ain't never seen nobody in their position get out from where they're at. You know, they ain't never seen nobody who has gone through mental breakdown, abuse, struggles, pain, be able to successfully say they went to see a therapist and this is where they're at right now because everyone talks, you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. So when you are, when God is pushing you towards that, there's a reason. There is a purpose because your testimony is the pathway for someone else. Your testimony is the light for someone else to see that there is hope, to see God, to see the benefit of being a part of the kingdom, to actually say, you know what, I need that healing. And when I really thought about it and some of the things that I just decided to keep secret and I was dealing with, I decided to completely let it all out. Like, I am been a firmly and vocally about me in therapy. Like, me and my therapist is the best of friends. And I know I did get a lot of slack from people that were in, you know, the ministries or in the church because it was like, you're supposed to pray, you know, all you need to do is pray. You're not praying hard enough um, if you have to go to a therapist. And that is absolutely not true because God has been trying to get me to get to this person for so long because this particular therapist dealt with the issues that I had. You know, I am a survivor of physical, you know, abuse and sexual abuse as a child. And this therapist, that's what her, her life's work was in. This therapist was able to help me move along, and with my spiritual coach, and my, you know, they worked hand in hand to get me to a place where I didn't feel like beating, I didn't need to beat myself up, that I knew that I was valuable, I knew that I was worth, you know, worth something, I knew that it wasn't my fault. So I stopped beginning to come out of that victim mentality. And as I was coming out of that victim mentality that had enshrouded me all my life, other people began to see that, wait a minute, I can go talk to somebody. I can get help. It's okay. I'm going to make it. I'm going to be fine. And these people were watching me, and I didn't even know it. But that was because I decided that it was time for me to get back into position. And I had to ask for forgiveness and ask God to, you know, restore me 
because when I first decided I was going to get back in line, I did it begrudgingly. And so, therefore, it wasn't effective because my heart really wasn't in it. But when I realized that someone else besides me needed me to do this, that it was hindering someone else for me not to be open and transparent and honest and be vocal about these things, I knew that I didn't ever want somebody to feel the despair and the hurt and the darkness that I felt because I didn't know that I could talk to someone. I didn't know that others went through it and that there was a whole community of people who needed to hear others talk about it and how they went through and how they moved through and how my therapist and the word helped me through. Now, I understand some people may be upset. Some people may never listen to the show again, and I'm okay with that. I'm not, I'm not going to continue to pray for you. I'm going to continue to seek God's love for you. But we can no longer be a part of a victim mentality. We can no longer be selfish in what God has given to us. We can't keep holding on to it, hoping that we're going to get over something, we're going to do this, we potentially move forward and finally get it together, and, or we're waiting for us to get our lives together before we walk in the ministry that God has given us. Let me explain. The, the, the ministry, the church, is a hospital, and the hospital takes care of sick people. And it means all types of illnesses, all types. He doesn't, you know, prejudge and say, well, this one is more important than the other one. We are all important to the Father. We are all important to him. So he's not going to say, well, one is better than the other, one is this, but no. And we have to get out of that. Because the God that I serve is bigger than any issue, any problem that you can ever, ever have. And it doesn't matter what you may think. It doesn't matter what someone else may think. Think about your lowest point in life that you had ever been through and think about how God has lifted you out of that. And think about the joy that you felt when he did. But think about also how you wish that you had someone that you could talk to about it, that you had someone that understood the pain that you're going through and could pray with you and could say, you know what, it's okay to feel that way. You're just about to feel in that way. Go ahead and do all the things that you need to do. Wouldn't that make you feel better? Wouldn't it have made you come out of your shell more? Absolutely. But we keep it bottled up inside, and that's not always our fault. We're always taught to not tell people what we do or what's going on in the home or if we're going through anything else because somebody's going to judge us, somebody's going to, you know, say something. We always have to be concerned about what someone else is going to say. At this point in this life, we need to be concerned about what God is going to say. We've got to be concerned about how he's going to move, when he's going to move, and nothing else. Nothing else. Because our friends can't offer us salvation. They can't, they don't, they can't take us to heaven. They can't forgive our sins and put it in the sea of forgetfulness. They can't cover us with the blood and take us into battle of spiritual warfare. They can't bring to the manifestation all the blessings and the glories and the promises and the position and the purpose he's given us. They can't do that. So we can't be concerned about what they may say. And, and, and the funny part with it a lot of the times is we think about, hmm, I really do want to do that, but that may not be a good look. A good look? What do you mean? The Holy Spirit is a good look. He's a good look, a powerful look. 
he's just all of that and then some. I couldn't even imagine my life without him. If you think about that, you know, I've learned that staying in position has been so profitable. And I don't mean in a financial aspect. It has been financially, but it has been more profitable to me spiritually, emotionally, physically. Because when you begin to stay in position with God, your mind is now centered on him. And because your mind is centered on him, you're not wavering about what you should and shouldn't do, how you should move, how you should go this way, what you should do the next day, what your overall purpose is, because your your mind is so focusedly centered on him that it's blocking out all of the naysayers, the non-issues, you know issues, the things that have nothing to do with what he's trying to do and where he's trying to get you to. And then because your mind is fully focused on him, you have that spiritual connection because now that relationship is strengthened. You're studying more. You're praying more. You're seeking him more. You're, you're in your quiet space. And therefore, you're not allowing anything else to interfere with that connection. You're listening and tell, for him to tell you how to move, when to move, where to move. You're listening for him to tell you when to do certain things and how to respond to other people. And then because your mental and your spiritual are in, li- in alignment, physical is easy to become in alignment because now you don't have any stress. Now you don't have any drama. Now you're not dealing with what, what Mary said and what Joseph said and what, you know, Tommy down the street said. You ain't worried about any of those things. So, therefore, you, you take the stress off of your body. And because of that, because you want to keep your body healthy, whatever, you're beginning to do the things you're eating right. You're beginning to take care of your body, making sure you exercise, making sure you're hydrating because it's all a part of being in alignment with him. So when you stay in position, your whole body, your physical, your mental, and your spiritual is all well. It's doing, it's like a glow. It's, I had someone, I had my aunt say, um, conference I went to today, I've done some new headshots, and she said, you look happy. You, this is the first time I've seen you look happy in a long time. And at first I was taken aback by that. But then I thought about it. And she's really right. I hadn't been happy in a long time. Hadn't, hadn't been happy in a real, real long time. I had been going through because I was not staying in position. I kept going astray. I kept doing what I wanted to do so you could see the stress written all over me. I wasn't happy. I was frustrated. I was tired. I was beginning to try to make decisions outside of him. And so to have that, you know, thought process and for someone to see it on you, because it will be shown. You don't have to scream it to the rooftop that you're in position. Not at all. Because God is going to do it for you. Your stature is going to show that you're in position. Your life is going to show that you're in position. The light that you give is going to show that you're in position. You know, so you never, ever have to worry about being out of position. And so, like, I was in the grocery store, you know, the other day, and the line was really, really long. And, of course, you know, you think about the grocery store, everyone's ready to go. you got kids crying. Basically, it was just a lot going on. And I had... A couple of people in front of me, but there was this one woman who was just annoyed. She was ticked off, um, and she was ready to go. And so what she did was, you know, 
out of being frustrated, she was just talking crazy to the cashier. She was being loud. And then what she was trying to do is she was trying to get us to join along in this discord. And, of course, you know, she would, you know, turn to me. She would complain, oh, my goodness, why is this taking so long? They need to hire more people. Now, pre-me would have probably engaged her. But the me now that's staying in my position with God didn't even take the bait. I refused to take the bait. And she continued to yell. And, you know, of course, you had a couple of others who maybe ran along with it, you know. And I was like, I'm not getting involved in this. I'm not going to say nothing. I'm not even going to give her eye contact, you know, to even think that I'm going to help her, you know, egg this along. You know, and she kept on, she kept going on and on. And finally, after this was about maybe 10, 15 minutes of her doing this, this was a fairly long line, a lot of groceries. Hey, it's a grocery store, you know. And she basically was like, okay, um, let me just stop acting crazy because this isn't going to change anything. And I still got to sit here. Well, the woman in front of her had a pop an issue with the item, and they requested a price check. And this lady, the lady was when she went into lift off. Like she began screaming, she was cursing, she was saying she's never come back to the store. And then basically what she did is she just took her cart, put it to the side, and completely left. You know, and the thing was is that, she was the very next person in line. But because she lost her cool, she was no longer the next person. Not only did she leave unhappy, she left without what she came for. You know, all she had to do was wait a few more moments and she would have been able to get everything she needed. You know, now, basically, you know, after she had her meltdown, everything went through, I, I went ahead, I checked out, and with my groceries, and, you know, if you think about it, one person left angry and empty-handed. And when I was thinking, as I was on my way home, I thought about how often we make the mistake of losing our composure and jumping ship just when things are about to turn around for us. How many times have we gotten frustrated with our circumstances and forfeited our blessing simply because we refuse to wait and to stay in position? I know plenty of times I have, you know. You, you know, you might be going through your day, and if you could just hold on just a little while longer because you're next in line for your breakthrough, you know, don't leave from your position. You know, don't move. When I think about this, it makes me think about Acts 1. You know, after Jesus had been crucified and risen, you know, he spent 40 days on earth with his disciples, you know. And when one day while he was eating with them, Jesus told these men to stay in Jerusalem and wait for a special gift he had promised them, which was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, in Acts 1-5, you know, he told them in a few days something amazing was going to happen. You know, John the you know, Baptist baptized them with water, but if they had waited, he was going to be baptized them with the Holy Spirit, which would ultimately equip them to be effective in ministry. Now, what if they had doubted and gotten out of position? They wouldn't have received the most amazing gift that empowered them to be witnesses for Christ. But I'm thankful that they waited, you know, and we have their example today. You know, Acts 2, 1 tells us when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. They waited in that upper room, fully assured that Jesus, what Jesus told them would manifest. They were in the place when the power of God fell. They received everything He had for them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They spoke in languages they did not know and began declaring the works of the Lord. What can we learn from this? When we stay in position and wait for the manifestation of the promises of God, God always makes good on his word. You know, God is saying to you, don't move. 
Don't you dare walk away. Stay faithful. Keep trusting him. Be confident that he's faithful that promise. You know, God is doing a new thing in your life and even in my life. He's empowering us to do all that he's preordained us to do. But all we have to do is wait. You know, God can be trusted to perform the work. But can you, can I, can we be trusted to wait? Because God is going to do what he said he's going to do. He always has. But can we stand the test and stay in position and wait for the appointed time for him to bestow the blessings he said he's going to give us? Now, again, I know it's not easy every day, you know, and others may throw in the towel and walk away. There has been times that I have thrown in my towel and lost myself for a minute and went running to pick it back up. There has been times I've thrown in the towel and gotten so far out the wheel that he had to restore me back to where I was at. But see, this time I'm not throwing in the towel. Because too much is riding on it. Too much is dependent on it. Too many people are dependent on me being in position. So it's not a job about just me any longer. And I can't be selfish in being out of position because not only do I want God to bless me, I want you to receive everything that God has promised from me being obedient. I get it now that I am a path of light for someone. And even if it's one person, that one person is going to see God through my obedience. And that is so important. You know, we might grow weary, you know, and it can be fun, but don't you dare, don't you dare, don't you dare get out of position because God has so much in store for us. He's declared blessings and favor over you. If you move out of alignment, you'll miss what God is doing, you know, and we can't miss it. You know, we think about when we were coming up and we were kids and we would always say that we had time. We had time to get it right. We had time to get it together. We don't have time anymore. We don't. We do not have the luxury of saying, okay, I'll get it together in five years. I'll get it together in 20 years. We don't have that luxury. We have to get it together now. And because now I know that and I've accepted that, that means I'm not getting out of position any longer because I don't want to be selfish and I don't want, you know, somebody to miss their blessing or have to take a longer route to get to what God wants them to be because I moved out of alignment. We have to all understand we are pieces to a large puzzle. We all interlock together. And not only do we interlock together, we sometimes build upon one another. So just like when I think of my grandmother, that was a praying woman. And I know it was her prayers that got me some of the darkest days in my life. And even after she had left this earth, the prayers that she had prayed up was still covering me for a very long time because there were times when I couldn't pray myself that I didn't even know or have the wherewithal to even think to pray for myself. She laid the foundation for me to be able to step upon to get to the next level. And that's what we are. We are all ministers in Christ, and we minister differently. You may say, well, I don't speak amongst people. The encouragement that you give a coworker each and every day is ministering. The smile that you give someone 
each and every day you're ministering. Speaking to that person that no one ever speaks to, but you always speak to that person, you ask them how they're doing, you're ministering to that person each and every day because that is giving that person hope and faith, and it's showing them love. And you don't know, they may not be getting it where they're at. So every day you show a glimpse of the kingdom and you let the light of God shine through you, you are giving somebody hope and love, and you're giving them an encounter with Christ. So they look forward. Have you ever had a group of people or certain people that always just want to be around you? And I'm not talking about the ones that pull on you, leech on you, always need something, always want something. I'm talking about those people who just bask in the glory of you. When, they, when they're in your presence, they leave better. They leave happier. They leave fulfilled. That's because the light of God that is shining throughout you, sometimes it only takes your presence. And you may not understand it. You may not know because sometimes – God is showing what's within us, even though sometimes we not, may not have fully accepted the call because we're still trying to think about and walk and learn and not figure it out on our own, but we're still seeking him to guide us. But even in your transition, even in your journey, you're ministering. So never take it lightly that the trials and the tribulations and the struggles and the journey that you're going through is in vain. And sometimes you may be thinking, why am I going through this? Because somebody needs to see you go through it and see how God brings you out. Because in them seeing that, it's going to bring them to the kingdom and make sure that they can come out of there so someone else can do it too. You know, don't miss it. You know, when I think about just simply standing in the faith, you know, you think of the latter half of Acts 1 and 4, you know, and put that, like, into your cup of inspiration, and it says, but wait for the gift of my Father, the gift my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. You know, the Lord is using his word to build up our faith and his promises and his provision, you know, and his unfailing word. If you wait and believe, you receive what he has said. Again, his word cannot come back void. It cannot come back unfulfilled. So therefore, let us be a part of the process. Let us be a part of the journey. Because if we don't get on board... He will, and I repeat, he will find someone else to execute the plan. And no, that person can't do it the way you were going to do it or the way I was going to do it, but it has to happen. And I'm going to be honest, I don't want him to leave me out of it. So, therefore, that means getting and staying in position, even when it's not fun even when it's not, you know, the new go-to, how you want to do it, does it look good. Even if, and I'm not even going to say even if, it has cost me people that I thought that was close, only to realize that they just wasn't ready for what God had for me. And that it's not that they're not going to come along, they just couldn't come along with me. They couldn't come along the journey with me. I am going to lay the foundation for them to come forward if they choose to. But I know that they had to be left behind because in taking them with me, it was going to then cause a problem and an issue. And then my focus would have been too on them and not on my creator, not on my father, not on the one who was propelling me into the purpose. And he's a jealous God. He's, he doesn't, you can't have anything else above him. He will remove it. 
he will definitely remove whatever is speaking above him. He's not going to have it. Definitely not. So we need to stay in position. We don't need to stay in our lane. We need to stay in position. Staying in our lane is what the world uses. It's what they use in the job environment, what they use to do, you know, say, you know, stay in your lane, stay in your lane, stay in your knowledge point. When we're in God, we have many very, you know, knowledge points. So we got to stay in the position because how we stay in the position and he tells us to go left and we go left, we may have to speak on, accounting. And then he says, you know what, you did that, go right, and I'm going to have you speak on, you know, business development. He is always going to be the driver in this position. And that's who I want to go with. Too long have have I been, you know, just wandering to and fro. And I don't want anybody else to wander so that I know that my obedience is necessary. It is absolutely necessary for your growth as well. So I'm going to do everything I need to do in order to make sure that I stay in position and that you can have everything that you need staying in position. Don't let the smallest thing deter you. Don't let the minuscule, the trials, the tribulations knock you off point and off track because your blessing is on the way. It is in full place, it's in full play, and what he's doing, he's looking for you. He's sitting right there on the field. He's got that ball, and he is waiting to throw it. And now what he's doing is that right now for some of us, he sees we're not fully in position and he's trying to get us there. He's trying to give us the time because he doesn't want us to miss this blessing. So some of us, he's pushing a little bit harder. Some of us, he's, you know, pulling. He's just like, you know, imparting on us. He's bringing other people into our lives to say, listen, we need you to get on board. We need you to stay in position. We need you to act like you know what you're doing. Because God is about to release this blessing, and we can't have you miss it. So for those who are listening this evening, God has your blessing, and he's gearing up to throw this ball. He's gearing up to bestow it upon you and shower it down on you. And, but the thing is, he's waiting. He's trying to wait a little bit longer because he doesn't want an interception. He doesn't want the enemy to come in there and then take your blessing and go someplace else with it. He wants you to catch it. He wants you to catch it. He doesn't want no one else to catch it. He doesn't want to, you know, have another team member catch it and go someplace else with it and, you know, move. He wants you to be in position to catch it. So if that means seeking him more, it means praying more, it means developing that stronger relationship with him, do it. Because once he throws it and it's in the air, it's either going to come to you or it's going to go to the opposing team. And again, we don't want it to go to the opposing team. Don't stray. Don't waver. Stay in position. I want to thank you for listening to the Moving Past You Radio Show this evening. Um, it was a blessing to have you. I um, want you to visit our Facebook page, you know, to join the conversation, get show notes, you know, get some fantastic bonus content. Um, if you are listening to on the replay, you listen to it on Praise Orlando um, Facebook page, or you can go to iTunes or Spotify and just search Moving Has You, and you'll be able to find us. And as I like to leave you, I want you to always remember to be kind in your word, in your thought, and in your deed. Be blessed. Have a wonderful evening, and we will talk to you next week. Have a great one. Goodbye. <laughs>